Welcome to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We're glad that you could join us for lesson number six, I Will Arise. Let's begin today with prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us together again this week as we continue to look at the Psalms and find encouragement and answers to the challenging difficulties that we find in life. We ask that you'll bless us and encourage us and help us to find hope once again this week. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our guest once again this week is Dr. Dragoslava Santrak. She has a PhD in Old Testament and is absolutely thrilled to be sharing with us about the book of Psalms. Slava, thank you for being with us once again. Thank you for having me here. So we are now looking at week number six. We're almost halfway through our studies of the book of Psalms. Last week in week number five, we kind of dwelt upon the hope, or at least we ended with the hope that God is in charge, that ultimately he's going to uh, bring justice and restoration and, uh, and so forth. And what do the Psalms say makes God kind of the ultimate hope that we have? And how does, he, how does he intervene in the challenges that we see going on in the world right now? Where's the hope in that? Or how do we find hope in that? Well, God's power as creator and sovereign king in judge is unparalleled in this world. However, the key here that the psalmist uh, highlights so many times is that God can be trusted, that He is reliable. So not only that He is able to do it, He is willing to do it. And if we turn to Psalm 18, which is a beautiful song uh, to the God, the Sovereign Savior, we read that the psalmist is in deep trouble he says that the pangs of death surrounded him. And in the midst of all of that, he proclaims a wonderful message in verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. Therefore, for the psalmist, this is so very important to know that God is not just able but that he has proven himself to be reliable and trustworthy. And we will see that it's done through creation. And Psalm 18 employs the language of creation. And we read about the clouds and fire and thunders and seas. And the foundations of the world are uncovered and shaken when God is coming to save and deliver his faithful people. So this creation language points to God's power, but also to his involvement with the world that he's created. And in the midst of all of that, His Word is proven to be true. So God is faithful, and that's the source of great hope for all who believe. What about His intervention here in this world? Some, again, sometimes people get this idea that God is, He's God, He's off somewhere in the universe doing His thing. And while He may not really like what's happening here, He's a little bit distant, a little bit removed from it. But that's not the picture that we get here in Psalms, is it? Yes. Well, we can uh, uh, maybe wonder, was the psalmist's deliverance as dramatic as the psalmist uh, uh, describes it in Psalm 18, where God shoots his arrows and smoke went up from his nostrils and he's riding on the clouds. It's a very dramatic scene. Uh, but we may wonder, is, did it really happen that way? Well, for someone who was in deep trouble, and seen and, and, and was a witness of God's deliverance, it is as dramatic and wonderful as, as it sounds in this psalm. Though God will sometimes work in quiet ways through circumstances that to an unobservant person may seem like even a coincidence, but working behind the scenes does not make God's intervention a less intervention than it is. But yes, God does answer prayers and He does intervene in the lives of His children. And those who have experienced God's deliverance in various ways in their lives, they know that God is living and that He is there. Though sometimes God does call us to wait, but in His time, He will appear, He will intervene. 
You know, some of this this language that you just shared here with the, the arrows and the smoke coming out of his nostrils, you get this picture that God is not a, he's not a passive God. He's just, he's not in the background, kind of in the shadows, but he's very much involved. And, and sometimes in, in the book of Psalms, you see this depiction of him as a warrior. Now, we may not always think of God as a warrior. I, I, I think we, we view him as powerful, but this warrior imagery is, is something that that maybe we could learn something more about God's character. Yes, yes. No, that, that's right. And and the picture of war and God is warrior. It's a, a little bit strange, especially for us today. But again, let's try to see this image from the point of view of the oppressed, from the point of view of those who suffer, who are who are imprisoned. Uh, uh, they need a warrior, not a weak God. And God is definitely not weak. He is a warrior. He takes the sufferings of his people seriously. And the image of warrior uh, uh, points to the severity and urgency of God's response. And my favorite image or portrayal of God as, as a warrior is in Psalm 98. And here we can learn about the kind of warrior God is. Or oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done marvelous things. His right hand and His holy arm have gained Him the victory. The Lord has made known His salvation, His righteousness He has revealed in the sight of the nations. What kind of warrior is God? God is the warrior who fights to bring salvation. The verse says that the Lord has made known His salvation. And also His holy arm has gained Him the victory. The, word for, the Hebrew word for victory, Hoshia here, also means salvation. So the Lord wages wars to bring salvation to people, to those who are oppressed and, and, and to those who suffer. And what I also find very encouraging and inspiring here is that the psalm says that God gave, gained him the victory and made known his salvation. We may wonder, how is it that God gained him, uh, him a victory? Did he need that victory? Was the salvation for himself? Well, obviously here God is identifying himself with the oppressed, with the suffering, with his people, meaning that their salvation is his salvation. His victory is their victory. And uh, there is also this universe, universalistic approach, universal salvation, because the earth, verse 3, have seen the salvation of God, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. So this is the kind of warrior that we uh, uh, talk about when we speak of God as warrior. So it's a, a warrior who connects himself with those who are going through the challenges, who uh, maybe don't feel that they have the power. They're in a, a position where they feel powerless, yes. but they can see that they have a God who is all powerful, who fights on their side and fights on their behalf. The psalmist uses a lot of these words, but did God always fight on the side of the psalmist? Uh, did the psalmist always receive the answers to the prayers that he expected, that he hoped? Uh, my suspicion is it's maybe not always what he hoped. Yes, yes. And, and, and I, I believe that many of us are wondering the same thing. Does God always intervene? And uh, when we read the Psalms, the Psalms are full of hope and confidence. And we may get this idea that, well, it was easy for the Psalmist. Look, God would always e uh, intervene immediately, but it was not always so. And many Psalms actually tell us about that and, and, and teach us what to do in situations like this. For example, Psalms 142, if maybe someone is going to the period of waiting on God and praying and still not receiving the answer from God, reading Psalms 142 and 143, these earnest prayers for deliverance. And um, 
Although the psalmist still does not have the answer from God, he resolves to doing something. The psalmist is not passive. He is not being depressed and, and worrying. Instead, he turns to meditating and remembering. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the work of your hand. And this is uh, uh, the continuation of his plea for deliverance. And, and uh, the psalmist now turns to the sources of hope, which is God's intervention in the past. And um, the triple repetition here, I remember, I meditate, I muse, tells us of this fervent need to draw closer to God. And then we also have these beautiful expressions, I muse on the work of your hand. And then in the next verse, the psalmist says, my hand, your hand, my hand. Then in verse 7, my spirit. In verse 10, he says, your spirit, your hand, my hand, my spirit, your spirit. In these times of waiting, the psalmist fervently wants to draw near, near to God. And I think God wants to see that. He longs to be close to us. He longs to be near us. Or, I mean, He is near us. He is close to us, but He longs for us to recognize that He is near us and that He is close to us. And sometimes, unfortunately, we forget that, especially when we're going through, uh, through difficult times, through challenging times. But these are psalms that can help us to see that we're not alone when we feel um, discouraged, yes. when we feel that life is against us, that, that they, whoever they happen to be, but they are, uh, are making our lives difficult. God's right there. Yes. And He wants us to place our hands in His hands and, and our spirit united with His spirit can give us hope and can give us encouragement. These are some, uh, some incredible Psalms we're looking at. I will arise. And if you want to dig more into this quarter's Sabbath school lesson, make sure that you pick up the companion book to this quarter's Sabbath school lesson. You will find it at itiswritten.shop. It's on the course of the book of Psalms. And uh, Dr. Martin Klingbeil is the author, and he is a wealth of information on the book of Psalms. So between the study guide that you're going through right now and Dr. Klingbeil's book, you're going to find uh, additional depth. You're going to find more meaning, uh, greater understanding of the book of Psalms. And through that, not only will your own strength or your own walk be strengthened, but you're going to find that others will be as well as you seek to share encouragement and hope with them. We're going to be back in just a moment as we continue looking at lesson number six, I Will Arise. It's one of the great stories of the Bible, a shepherd boy against a giant. It's a story that speaks to your story. Human beings weakened by years of sin up against an enemy with years of experience in sin. I'm John Bradshaw. Join me on location in Israel for David and Goliath. We'll go to the Valley of Elah where the conflict between Judah and the Philistines took place. We'll visit the stream where David selected five stones and see the hillsides on which Israel and the Philistines camped. The Bible comes alive in David and Goliath. Faith in the face of darkness, faith in the midst of faithlessness and failure, and reliance upon God when all other hope is gone. David and Goliath, filmed on location in Israel. Hope in the midst of trials, the power of a mighty God. Deliverance when deliverance is needed. Don't miss David and Goliath, brought to you by It Is Written TV. More and more people are watching It Is Written TV. They're watching their favorite It Is Written programs, listening to inspiring sermon series, and much more. They're watching them here, here, and even here. See for yourself why people are turning to It Is Written TV to watch their favorite Christian programs live and on demand. Watch It Is Written TV for free anytime on Roku, Apple TV, and at itiswritten.tv. Welcome back to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. We're continuing our study of lesson number six, I Will Arise. Slava, let me ask you this question. It's clear that God 
intervenes from time to time in Earth's history. We know that he's going to be intervening when Jesus comes back again. But are there times when God expects his people, you, me, others, to play an active role in the restorative work that he is doing here on planet Earth? Where do we fit into all this? Or is he just kind of doing everything on his own and, and we just hope for the best? Yes, well, sometimes it becomes so easy to take the Psalms and, and other uh, parts of the Bible where God speaks about His intervention and His acts of salvation and deliverance, to take all these verses and uh, serve as a kind of excuse for us to do nothing. Why? Because God will do everything. However, the Psalms do not give us this uh, excuse to give over to God our responsibility. And we do play a significant part and have a responsibility when it comes to the deliverance and seeking justice and restoring the world to what God wants it to be. And um, we can mention several Psalms in this context. For example, Psalm 41. It says, blessed is he who considers the poor the Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. So here we see that the Lord puts together our consideration for the poor, our work on alleviating suffering in the world with our own salvation and blessing and well-being. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. So we are to consider the poor, we are to, to be involved in the work of helping the unfortunate and restoring the justice in the world. And then Psalm 82. This is an excellent, excellent Psalm that uh, speaks about our responsibility in God's, in God's work on this uh, earth. And it is the Psalm, a plea for justice, and we see God standing in the congregation of the mighty. And then it says, he judges among the gods. A very interesting uh, a choice of words. Why would God call the gods? Why is he judging among the gods? And then we are trying to understand the identity of these gods. And God says, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. And these are all requirements we find in Deuteronomy and requirements that God had of, of his leaders and judges, but by extent of his people as well. So God expects his people to be involved. But it's interesting that God calls the judges gods. And there is a whole uh, poetic ambiguity and wordplay in this psalm where God is calling people who think they have authority and behave as if they are gods because they are above the law or they think that they are above the law. But then God says, I'm the one who will stand and judge you. And then later it says, you are gods, but you shall die like a man. So you think you are gods. You do have this authority and privilege from me to serve as leaders. But if you don't use it justly and correctly, you will die like mere men, because that's exactly what you are. No one is above the law. Uh, that really helps, mm -hmm. I think, put everybody uh, right where they ought to be. Mm. Uh, because there are some people today who are in positions of authority, exactly. who may do things that are mm, out of line with God's will, we'll put it that way, and think that they don't have to answer to anybody. Well, ultimately what it sounds like here is that God is going to, he's going to be just. He's going to bring fairness and, uh, and justice in the end. How much should we be involved in? Where is, is there a line between can we do? Can we try to do God's work, uh, or where does our work end? Is there, or do the two work together? Is there is there a hard line between God's work and our work, or is He trying to to help us find ways to work in concert with Him 
as we try to relieve the, the pain and the suffering of, of the needy and the poor? How does that all work together? Yes. Well, you already hinted it correctly that this is combined work with God. It is not us who are doing our work, it is us joining God in His work. And that's why prayer is very important and seeking God's will, because we don't want to have projects of our own and trying to impress God and people. We ask God humbly to give us the opportunity and show us the ways how we can join Him in His work of restoration. And God will lead us, God will open the doors and give, give the opportunities for that. So we're talking about helping those who are in need. Uh, the, the term social justice is frequently um, talked of these days. How does social justice fit with what we're talking about? Are they kind of part and parcel? Are they separate? Are they different? How does this all fit together in Psalms? Well, in the Psalms, there is a no such term as social justice. I'm not sure if that phrase appears in the Bible. Social justice is something that in these modern times we like to talk about a lot. Because for the psalmist, justice, social justice, what we call social justice, is an inevitable part of personal piety. That's not a separate thing that we do. Oh, we serve God here, but then we remember that there is something called social justice, and then we go and do it sporadically. Doing social justice, taking care of our communities, uh, uh, helping people, being involved, is what piety, faith in action is all about. And that's why we see in the Psalms that what we call social justice and worship are tied very closely together. And we can uh, point to certain psalms and, and read uh, about that. So wh what might that look like in, in practical terms? Let's say I'm living my life and I happen to see an opportunity to help someone. Um, how might that play itself out and how would that be an extension, a connection of my worship with God? Well, let's, let's go and check some of the psalms especially Psalms 15 and 24 can help us in that regard, where we see that, that what you mentioned, Eric, is, is a way of life, is not something that we necessarily think about. It is the way we respond almost naturally because we live at the center of God's will and, and His Spirit. And uh, we read here in uh, Psalm 15, who may abide in your tabernacle, Lord? Who may dwell in your holy hill? So therefore, if we are to abide in God's presence, then verse uh, 2 says, He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear God, etc., etc. Then he does not take money from uh, uh, the innocent, and then he who does these things shall never be moved. So in order to abide in God's presence, we need to live, and we live like God lives. Uh, his values, His character is reflected in us. Or Psalm 24, just briefly, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord, etc. So ethical choices that we make in life are part of worship. And what we do in our everyday life opportunities that God places on our path, we should not take them as something that happened by chance. It is maybe God who plays them. If we remember Jesus, when, when the people asked, Lord, when did we see you in prison? When did we see you naked or, or hungry and helped you? What did Jesus say? When you did to the least of, 
of these children of mine, you did it to me. You know, in, in joining hands with God, if I can use that, that imagery in this, not only are we helping others, but in helping others, I'm going to assume that there's a, a benefit to ourselves, that somehow that helps us. How can, what's the benefit to us in helping others? Well, as Psalm 41, when we partner with God, with God in doing these things, we ourselves are blessed because we are brought closer to God. We get to understand who God really is and what His mission in this world is all about. We get strengthened, we get restored, we get encouraged, and we learn to be thankful and satisfied in all circumstances. Like uh, the Apostle Paul said, I know how to have plenty and to have little, because we partner with God and, and we understand the path that Jesus went through, and we are following Him. Slava, if somebody was kind of thinking right now, I know of an opportunity, what, what should I do? Um, how would you encourage them in that? Yes, well, I would tell them, I would tell you to join the psalmist and not remain silent in the face of injustices and oppression. Raise your voices in prayer to God and ask God for the opportunities and for these wonderful privileges to join with Him and partner with Him in doing His work in this world. And let Psalm 72 serve as both as encouragement and guidance to us. For He, the Lord, will deliver the needy when He cries, the poor also, and him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and needy, and will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from the oppression and violence, and precious shall be their blood in His sight. It is both an encouragement of our deliverance, but also a call for us to join God in His work of deliverance of people. Slava, thank you for helping us to see today how we can join hands with God in helping His children who are going through challenging times. We hope that you also have been encouraged as you've seen how we can link hands, link arms with God and be a blessing to others. We're going to continue our study of the Psalms next week as we look at lesson number seven, and we look forward to having you join us as well. This has been Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written.